Me. We are very honored today to have Jennifer Burns talk about this beautiful book in front of me, Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. Not The Last Conservative. <laughs> 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 that's title, I, I like it very much. But uh, nobody at this table. Is Jennifer is at the Hoover Institution, the History Department of Stanford. Stanford. Just to what you think and, uh, <laughs> We can't think of a better topic. Right? Frank Milton was here for a number of years. I have memories of having dinner with him at North Beach restaurant up in San Francisco. And I have to say one thing. Oh, broke the license plate. <laughs> plates are there. Same, same, the secretaries, Cindy said it anyway. But it was so, so thank you so much for doing the book and for telling us about it. We're all very anxious to hear. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks everyone for who is here in the room and on Zoom. Um, uh, besides thanking John Taylor, I also want to um, do a shout out to Michael Bordo, who has been um, just a really wonderful interlocutor through me throughout this whole project. Um, likewise, George Tavlis, who's come through Hoover on the regular and um, uh, you know really helped me understand some of the origins of Chicago monetary economics. Also, John Cochran, who helped me know what it was like to be in a Chicago workshop when he read the manuscript. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Neil Ferguson has also been a great supporter. And then also a thank you to Ed Nelson, who's done prodigious research on Friedman that really helped inform my own. Um, so it's really special for me to be here as a presenter because I have been coming to this seminar um, for years and just watching and listening and learning. And so um, it's been a really important venue for me to learn about monetary policy and monetary theory. Now, technically the book is not published until next week, Tuesday. So those of you who are here are getting an advanced copy. Those of you who were signed up online will get an advanced copy and a sneak peek. There's plenty of copies right around the corner. So pick up one cheap. That's right. There's very cheap. Uh, there is such thing as a free book if you come to the seminar. Yeah. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is the historian method of talking for 30 to 40 minutes. And I'd be happy to take questions after, but I would ask you to hold them um, for the remainder. So um, this is not the first biography of Friedman, uh, as you well know. It is the first to really extensively rely upon as its major source, um, the archives at the Hoover Institution. And so this enables me to tell the story of Milton Friedman's life from his days as a Boy Scout in Rahway, New Jersey. He's there on the left to his growing renown as an economist across the 1970s. Here he is the all knowing seer on the cover of Time Magazine back when being on the cover of Time Magazine really meant something um, to his Nobel prize in economics and beyond. So I realized that this audience already knows a lot about Milton Friedman. In some ways he was a local because he ended his career here at the Hoover Institution. You uh, no doubt know him as a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, you know about his famous attack on the Phillips curve, his theory of permanent income, uh, his work as the founder of monetarism, his famous dictum, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. You may know him as a great champion of free markets, the author of books like Capitalism and Freedom, the star of the TV series, Free to Choose. You also likely know him as a policy innovator. And whenever I tick down the list of policies that were once, you know, <clears throat> wild ideas in Milton Friedman's mind that are now sort of characteristics of our social world, I'm, I'm always amazed anew. So um, income taxes withheld from your paycheck, darn. Uh, an armed force that relies on paid volunteers rather than draftees. Uh, state supplied educational vouchers to cover the cost of education. The negative income tax, the forerunner of uh, today's debates about universal basic income, and also the, uh, the long origin of the earned income tax credit, tax rebates as policy more generally. A world where international currencies float one against another. All these and more are the achievements of Milton Friedman. 
And you probably have a few others in mind, but I'm guessing that at least some of you may not have known until today, he was also a Boy Scout. So, so this is the biographer's task. How do I bring to life this monumental intellect, um, show that he was shaped by his times and in turn how he shaped them. And so today I wanna highlight a few episodes I cover in the book and spotlight some of the arguments that I make. And I wanna focus on three in particular. One is the consistency in Friedman's thought over time that, that I see through my research. The second is the role of women in his life and his work. And the third is Friedman's impact beyond economics. So let me start um, with this theme of consistency in Friedman's thought over time. And I started my research actually at the University of Chicago, not at the Hoover Institution. Um, uh, I went there while I could, uh, weather permitting, and scooped up as much archival material as I could find. And what I really did with this was immerse myself in his intellectual world, his foundational intellectual world as a young man, as a graduate student coming to the University of Chicago in 1932, which is basically the worst time of the Great Depression. Maybe we could debate if spring of 33 was even worse, but, but bad, things were bad. And um, he came to Chicago, as I mentioned, from Rahway, New Jersey, and from a somewhat unusual background for an American Jewish family of his day. He was raised in a small town. He was not raised in an urban center. Um, he was uh, acutely aware of himself and his family as being in a minority within this small town. Um, he sort of blazed his way through the public education system on to Rutgers University and then the University of Chicago. And uh, the Great Depression was more than the backdrop of his studies. It was really the reason he ended up choosing economics as a field of study. And so he arrives at this moment of economic crisis that is also a moment of political crisis. You have fascism on the rise, communism on the rise, all sorts of radical political movements proliferating. And um, Friedman was immediately immersed in these questions and the question basically of could capitalism survive? Could liberal democracy survive? What was its future? What if anything needed to change in order to make um, these ideas uh, uh, basically viable in a very changing world. And so Friedman's most influential teachers were those who consider themselves classical liberals. Men like Henry Simons and Frank Knight pictured here. Both of these men valued individual freedom, limited government and what they called uh, the price system's role in allocation. They wanted to preserve these things, but they felt that classical liberalism was on the defensive. Simply put, voters weren't buying what they were selling. How could it be reformulated or readjusted? Both of these men also believed strongly that the federal government had a role to play in the economic crisis of the times. And so um, I, I was initially surprised to find this out. I had maybe a caricature of the Chicago School in mind, but Friedman's professors felt there was an immediate place for relief spending in these early years of the Great Depression. So, so they were all um, you know, thinking about this basic question, how do we safeguard free markets and ensure broad prosperity? Um, how do we hold tight to some of our political ideals um, yet how do we modify laissez-faire capitalism in ways that make it viable in an age of an expanded state and an age of economic crisis? So there were basically two Chicago responses to the Great Depression. Um, one, a very formal response was what became known as the Chicago Plan. And I found in the archives just memo at version after version of the Chicago Plan, which was a, me a memo crafted by all of Friedman's professors and sent by them um, to the Roosevelt administration calling for um, two things. First, emergency relief spending, and there were a couple different telegrams first on emergency relief. And then the Chicago plan was actually a radical redesign of the American banking system that 
really would have changed it root and branch. And I would say about 80% of the Chicago plan went into the Banking Act of 1935. So they were calling for the very architecture of uh, banking reform that in fact happened in the United States. Um, there was also a Chicago response to the Great Depression, which was less uh, uh, formalized and more inchoate, which was a worry about inequality generated in capitalist systems and a worry that this inequality was sort of, as Henry Simons put it, quote, unlovely unto itself, but that it was also bad for social stability, that if you had an economic system that was continually generating a large gap uh, uh, across society or large gaps, that this would be uh, ultimately lead to its endangerment. And this, in, ha it in fact, was maybe what was happening at that current moment. So both of these became really important themes for Milton Friedman. The focus on banking and money and financial institutions really comes right out of the Chicago response to the Great Depression and the Chicago um, understanding of the Great Depression as uh, a deeply linked to the monetary situation. And uh, there was also this effort you see throughout Friedman's career to think about how do we balance the dynamism of capitalism against the social inequalities it may generate? How do we find this balance? How do we reconcile these tensions? So um, I've talked about his teachers, but arguably more important than his teachers were what I call the Room 7 gang. Um, and and uh, yes, yeah, I, you missed the point when I said this was a history talk, not an economics talk. So I will ask you to hold your uh, comment. Do you mind? Well, it's about Simons in particular. Okay, brief interlude about Simons. Okay, so part of his plan was general revenue sharing of the federal government and the state. So in his thinking uh, that heavily influenced Milton, decentralization was really important. Mm. Yeah. Federal spending and some relief spending, but also aid to the states uh, with a few strings attached. So uh, Simons, I would say, was really one of the major inspirations to the uh, Room 7 gang. I went to Chicago. I poked around. I could not find Room 7. So I have a photograph of what it may have looked like. This is actually Room 4. Um, but it might have been room seven because the door number is quite bright. But so what was room seven? It was in the basement of the social sciences building. And it was a place that was commandeered by Milton Friedman, George Stigler, Aaron Director, Henry Simons, and even, believe it or not, Paul Samuelson was there for a while. And this became really a second curriculum for Friedman, a really tight knit um, uh, student group, a sort of thick student culture, and these bonds lasted their whole life. Here is at least a segment of Room 7 attending the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947. So, so Friedman came out of Chicago um, with uh, uh, some skepticism of the New Deal as it evolved and a strong interest in the monetary dimensions of the Great Depression. And this was both something he learned from his teachers and things that became very influential in his student culture. That really was not just a student culture, it was the beginning of his sort of lifelong peer group. So how do I know this? Well, I feel the best guide to Understanding Friedman's thought, especially in this early years, is archival resources, you know, found here in the Hoover archives. And I'm talking about things like letters and notes um, that show his thinking, his private thoughts and ideas, not what he's publishing, but they augur important themes in what he does publish. Um, so here's a phrase I found in a letter um, that Aaron Director actually wrote in 1941. Or rather, this was a memo that Aaron Director wrote. Quote, inflation is basically a monetary phenomenon. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Freeman went on to call this memo the, quote, only halfway decent analysis I have seen uh, of what is happening in the wartime economy. Um, here's his teaching notes from 1940 and 1941 when he briefly taught at Wisconsin. And these were recorded by a student and they're... Um, they're in fragmentary phrasing, but then there's some notes in Friedman's hand on the side. So we know the student recorded these, he showed them to Friedman, they made their way into the archive. And here's some statements that were recorded, quote, public works had adverse effects on price structure, hence no private investment. Um, to the 1937 recession, quote, 
we could argue that government intervention made for lack of recovery, end quote, uh, uh, with regard to the 1937 recession being caused by a withdrawal of government spending, quote, government spending argument not convincing. Um, in a letter to Arthur Burns around the same time, he did his first trip out to the West Coast. Quote, the whole West, particularly California, and more particularly Southern California, gives you the feeling that the frontier is not yet gone and makes you feel like telling the stagnationites to come out and take a look. Now, this is a pretty unambiguous reference to Alvin Hansen, um, the idea that we had reached the ending of the frontier, which of course goes back to Frederick Jackson Turner's famous 1892 paper, um, and is taken up again um, by Hansen and others who argue we, the frontier is closed. We are now entering a state of secular stagnation and we need the federal government to go beyond this, right? And so um, you see here Friedman in his private correspondence writing to his closest friends and colleagues saying, I don't buy this idea. I don't think it's true. Um, so uh, I don't wanna say there aren't changes in Friedman's thought because there are, and I do track them in the book, but there's not a revolution in his basic intellectual or political orientation. What I really show in the book is that these are set very early. And here he is uh, at Milton and Rose in 1935. Here we go. I wanna talk now about my second theme, which is the role of women in his life and work. And as my research progressed, I just became more and more convinced that this is a secret of his success. This is not just boosterism. It actually comes from the fact that all of his major works, A Monetary History of the United States, Capitalism and Freedom, A Theory of the Consumption Function, all of these either had a co-author or major collaborators who were women. So one of these was Rose, uh, uh, who was listed as a contributor to Capitalism and Freedom and later uh, a co-author on Free to Choose. Another was Anna Schwartz. Now, as I've been describing, we know that in the 1940s, Friedman had the basic idea, you know, he didn't say inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena, but he was certainly sympathetic to this idea, uh, uh, which would really become this sort of founding idea of monetarism. So, so he didn't yet though have the evidence to really carry this argument forward. And he would make testing this hunch the sort of major goal of his career. And the person who did most of this testing was Anna Schwartz. So Schwartz was a brilliant woman who was sidelined by the sexism of her fellow economists. And Friedman was really one of the few who recognized her capacity and was thus able to benefit from it. So I described their partnership in some detail. Schwartz came to Friedman. It was sort of uh, uh, an arrangement brokered by Arthur Burns, the head of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And Schwartz was already an expert on uh, British monetary history and the British uh, economy. So she really had a strong historical background um, that Friedman did not. And together they started piecing together, uh, piecing together a story. And this story was sort of the story of money in the United States. And they were inspired by the quantity theory of money. They wanted to pay attention to the actual quantity of money in the US economy at various historical points. So um, this was deeply empirical work. Here's just one example of uh, many that I found in, in the archive here. Um, if you see at the top of this document, it says vault cash. This is in Schwartz's hand. Wow. And his sub columns are different types of banks or financial institutions. And she's adding up the figures. She's literally adding up the figures. And so this was just a prodigious amount of work. The type of data that economists today get in a few keystrokes literally had to be put together basically by Anna Schwartz. She did the day-to-day -day work. Friedman was busy as a tenured professor. Um, they had letters back and forth and they did this work together for more than a decade. And it's very important to note this happens at a time when very few economists are doing this type of work. This is deeply empirical work. We could even say old fashioned where most economists, the action is in econometrics, 
um, general equilibrium models, ever more sophisticated mathematical analyses, and Friedman and Schwartz are basically digging away here in what looks like a backwater. What years are you speaking of here? Uh, their partnership started in 1948, and the book is published in 1963. So that is uh, a pretty long time. It comes out in 1963. And uh, uh, I'll just briefly summarize the, the, the fundamental argument. Really, at the centerpiece of this book is the Great Depression. Friedman has gone back to that foundational moment of economic crisis and when he started his studies. And Friedman and Schwartz are able to document a 30% drop in the stock of money at the critical moment uh, in the Great Depression, which they call the Great Contraction. So we go from those columns of vault cash, eventually those come out into a graph like this. Um, and so the argument is really that the Great Depression is a monetary phenomenon. Now, at the same time though, Friedman and Schwartz clearly understood this was also an intellectual and political and institutional phenomena. After all, they argued the Federal Reserve could and should have present, prevented this deflation. The Federal Reserve was the lender of last resort that should have helped all those failing banks and uh, would have uh, kept money in the system, as they argue, sort of kept uh, things from getting so bad. And the reason why it didn't has something to do with economics, but it has a lot more to do with personality and institutions and, and uh, 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 how the federal system is set up, Federal Reserve system is set up at that moment. So, so historical research helps us see how this breakthrough was made, both in terms of the columns of vault cash. Um, and biography also gives us insight into why Freeman was such a great economist. And it was in large part because he took uh, people like Anna Schwartz seriously. He simply didn't have a large blind spot that many other economists of his day did. And uh, Rose Friedman and Anna Schwartz are only the most obvious cases. In my book, I talk about others. <laughs> and I was not able to find a picture of Dorothy Brady, uh, who was a close friend of both Rose and Milton. Here she is writing to Friedman in 1948. Quote, fundamentally, the only real test of a theory is in reasonably accurate prediction. And this experiment did not lead to a formula that could be used for prediction. So this is in 1948. This same argument would be made by Friedman in his 1953 essay uh, on uh, a prediction in economics. So, so this correspondence not only contains the germ of that idea, but this correspondence became essential to the theory of the consumption function and the work of uh, Dorothy Brady, Margaret Reed, and uh, uh, Rose Friedman were essential to it. Now, the story is hinted at in Friedman's introduction to a theory of the consumption function when Friedman says, oh, you know, we had these great summer conversations, um, you know, with these different economists, and oh, eventually the ideas came out. And he's as generous as he really can be at the time by saying this is a, quote, joint product. My hand just held the pen. Um, what he doesn't say, and what I discovered in my research, is that he was trying to get Dorothy Brady and Margaret Reed hired at the University of Chicago. And this was part of his long running battle with the Coles Commission, um, which I also discuss at some length. So Coles Commission economists um, were focused on econometrics. They were pioneers in designing large scale general equilibrium models. Um, they were all politically to the left, and Friedman couldn't stand them, and he wanted them out of Chicago. And so he basically hazed them for many years on end until they left. And as part of this process, um, he tried to get Reed and Brady hired because they were doing the type of economic work that he wanted to see done. And so he wrote up these ideas that had been discussed into a memo that went into went to his department to say, you should hire these women. And then this sort of ball got rolling and it would eventually uh, result in this uh, manuscript and the book. So, so these are the stories that you don't know if you haven't dug around in the archives and found this memo and been like, why, why, did, why is this memo here? What is this memo doing? And sort of piece together the broader context um, in which this makes sense for Friedman to advocate. And incidentally, Margaret Reed was hired at the University of Chicago. Um, she worked there for many years and sort of a legend um, among students there. She continued to be active as an emeritus well into her 90s. Dorothy Brady 
came briefly to Chicago and then uh, took a position at the University of Pennsylvania where she moved into economic history and was also very beloved by her students um, and uh, in that field. So, so okay, we, when we do this type of historical research, we know a little bit more about where these ideas came from. The other thing that generally isn't said or noticed is that Freeman's immersion in wow. consumption economics was extremely rare, even singular, for an economist of his day. Simply put, consumption economics was women's work. This adding up, this uh, uh, figuring out what families did, what they bought, when and why. He paid attention to this type of work and he reaped the benefits of it. When I try to step back and think, you know, what is the reason for Friedman being able to sort of have this, you know, comparative advantage, we might say that his peers did not. One thing I think is really important is that the University of Chicago had a tradition of keeping a woman on the economics faculty. And especially at mid-century, it was pretty much the only major university. So Berkeley had women in the 20s and it had them again in the late 60s, but it had none in mid-century. So and Harvard didn't have any until I think Claudia Golden maybe was the first to attain tenure there. So I would say Friedman was pretty much, aside from his peers in the University of Chicago program, one of the few economists who had actually seen a woman as a professor. And that may simply have opened his mind to have a perspective on them as potential intellectual equals or partners or collaborators. Um, so uh, uh, more in the book, but that's just the kind of overall on that. Um, and, and then I want to uh, talk a little bit about his impact beyond economics. And I do spend a lot of time in this book on the economics profession, which was not necessarily what I had planned or thought I would do, um, but I it got really, really interested in it. And there's lots of nuggets about the history of economics that I uncovered. I have a letter from Wesley Mitchell kind of laying out his very profound doubts about Friedman. Um, I have the details on the battle against the Coles Commission, um, which is depicted in a very lighthearted manner in Friedman's uh, memoir. I'll just say at least one person in this episode had a mental breakdown during it. Um, and I give voice to the frustration and anger many other economists felt with Friedman. And in some ways, particularly in the 1960s, it was because there was a great desire for unanimity in the field of economics and a great belief that if we all agreed on everything, you know, we'd be unstoppable, right? We'd roll up to DC and tell them what they should do. And pretty much everyone did agree upon everything, except there was this one guy, Friedman, poking his head up and saying, no, they've got it all wrong. Don't listen to them. And so, um, you know, people became very frustrated with him. So here's Paul Samuelson um, in Congress testifying on the same day as Friedman. And here's what he has to say about the quantity theory, quote, almost completely fallacious, quote, mystical view, quote, sophomore <laughs> fallacy, quote, fabricated concept. Okay, Paul, tell us how you really feel. Um, and so, so, so Friedman what, did not have the respect or the affection of his peers, I would say eventually he got their respect. It was still kind of a losing battle for their affection, I would say. Um, but Friedman had an impact beyond economics um, on policymakers, on politicians. Um, Barry Goldwater was among the first that Friedman knew. Um, Friedman actually courted him. He saw in, in Goldwater potentially kindred spirit. And Goldwater's uh, uh, campaign increased Friedman's <laughs> fame because Friedman had a, a sort of informal role, but he was largely the two were linked in the media. And that became one of Friedman's first uh, uh, steps into a broader public world. Um, Richard Nixon courted uh, uh, Friedman's um, uh, blessing. He really cared what Friedman thought about him and what Friedman said. That didn't mean he listened to him at all, but he nonetheless wanted to be on his good side. Um, the real vector of influence in the Nixon administration was George Shultz. And um, here's a picture of all of them together. And I talk about this in some detail, particularly how closely they worked together during the ending of Bretton Woods. And in, in Shultz's account, he was sort of laundering ideas that Friedman presented um, up into the treasury and, and kind of hiding Friedman's influence. And uh, it's interesting if you compare Paul Volcker's account 
of what happened and George Schultz's account of what happened and try to figure out who was really kind of driving the bus here. It's, it's a little bit unclear, but um, uh, uh, Schultz certainly um, portrayed him and Friedman as having kind of a master plan to move towards um, floating exchange rates. And so all of these uh, uh, made Friedman immensely important. This is another New York Times magazine where you see Friedman is sort of taken over the globe, right? So testimony to his, his wide ranging influence. And I also discovered that really Schultz and Friedman grew particularly close during Friedman's conflict with Arthur Burns, uh, shown here in a uh, down moment. <laughs> now, Friedman's differences with Burns are well known. Um, what's interesting, though, is they first emerged not really over the money supply um, or over the technical details of the inflation fight, but over what was called incomes policy. Um, so, so Friedman had met Burns in Rutgers, just to back up a little bit. He called him his father figure. He really venerated Burns like no one else. Friedman had lost his father at a young age, and when he came to Rutgers, um, he really identified with Burns in part because Burns was a very accomplished and admirable figure, in part because Burns, like him, was from a Jewish immigrant family and had achieved um, the type of success that, that Friedman could only hope for at that point. So. Burns was appointed to the chair of the Federal Reserve in January 1970, and it was widely interpreted as a victory for Friedman. This is why you have that Time magazine cover, you know, the weird head globe thing. Um, and everybody said, you know, the Fed is now going to say that money matters. Um, and that's not what happened. Now, at first, everything seemed great. Burns seemed to be kind of shaking things up and making the Fed more professional and more academic. And Friedman's really happy about all that. And then comes the bombshell. Arthur Burns comes out in support of incomes policy. Incomes policy is wage and price guidelines to fight inflation. And incomes policy is a Democratic Party idea. It's not uh, associated with Republicans at all. And it is a complete shock for Friedman that Burns would support this policy. And so I found these incredible letters in the archives. So basically, Friedman reads this in the newspaper. He's really upset. He tries to go to sleep. He can't sleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night and he scrawls out this anguished letter to Arthur Burns, um, including the memorable line, quote, never in my wildest dreams did I believe this central bank virus was so potent that it could corrupt even you in so short a time. Are we talking about August 15th here? or? or? Uh, I'm sorry, I did not record the exact date of that letter. There are many. No, no, I mean um, the, the August 15, 1971 speech. Uh, it is, um, is it's in West Virginia. Um, no, this is the speech because the speech is widely reported in the newspaper. Yeah. So basically Friedman gets opens, I don't know, the Chicago Tribune. He didn't read the New York times and it's a headline everywhere, you know, and he's like, what? I watched this. Anyway. You were there. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> On television. Ah, okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know it was televised. So at any rate, it's a big. It's a big moment, and um, I delve into kind of how that relationship unfolds and unravels. Um, Friedman predicted in that first letter, rightly, that Burns would go from incomes policy to wage and price controls, and then he was just profoundly disappointed by Burns's erratic monetary policy. He would send him letters saying things like, "What in God's name is happening?" You know, with his, and then and Friedman was also running his own number, so he'd be like, "Well, here's my M1 and M2 figures. Like, I don't care what you guys say. Here's what I see." Right? He's still got that uh, uh, capacity to do that research. So um, it, it goes on and on, and and Burns's monetary policy, um, you know, is 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 part of and perhaps the one of the major factors in the Great Inflation. It. It tells us something really important, though, both about Friedman, the person, and Friedman's place, um, you know, in economics and in the broader policy world at that time. First of all, that you know, this is such a profound break in the relationship, and and Friedman's very clear from the beginning that he's not going to give Burns any type of special favoritism. That the things Burns is doing, he would have criticized him were he anyone else, and he's not going to be able to hold back either. And he sort of warns Burns. He says, "Look, I'm going to have to." 
hammer you. I, there's no other way. So his, his integrity is more important to him than this lifelong relationship. Um, and then it also reminds us how out of the mainstream Friedman's ideas were at that moment in the early 1970s and how in the mainstream they are now. So around this time, Burns can credibly claim, as he's explaining his advocacy of wage and price controls, quote, monetary policy, I feel, has done its job fully. A chairman of the Fed simply passes a buck and says, I can't do anything more about inflation. Someone else has to do it. Um, so that incomes policy, wage and price controls were broadly accepted, um, really tells us something about the moment. Now, I don't want to say that Friedman was the only dissenter. It was pretty unanimous among economists that this was just sort of kicking the can down the road and wasn't going to really work in the long term. But the experience of the 1970s really shifted many people towards his perspective. And they saw that price controls didn't work, as he had predicted. They saw inflation had something to do with the Federal Reserve, and they opened their minds to his ideas and became you know, more receptive to his larger theoretical analysis. So in my book, I talk about other political leaders uh, Friedman uh, met with and show how his ideas spread more globally. I have a chapter on Margaret Thatcher. I have a chapter on uh, his connections to Chile. And in an epilogue, I try to take it up as best I can to our present moment and try to point out Friedman's continued relevancy for policy. So this is obviously a hot topic and one that's really uh, uh, not too settled at the moment. I'll just say that this last uh, epilogue is called Helicopter Drop, and it includes this graph. So I know you're all wondering about the title. Let me close out with the question I know you want to ask, which is why am I calling him the last conservative? And I myself have mixed feelings about um, the title, in some ways, I actually think it cuts against the grain of one of the major arguments I'm making, which is that Friedman is not just important to conservatives, uh, uh, and he's not just a conservative economist. In some ways, Friedman's ideas uh, about the importance of markets, about the centrality of monetary policy, really came to define the political center for a time in the United States. The Democratic Party became more market friendly in ways that I think reflect this broader intellectual shift of which Friedman was part. And a, a lot of people have noted these comments that uh, Joe Biden made more recently about Friedman and his influence. And you know, these really are um, these really have to do with inter-democratic party dynamics um, in that they bespeak a shift from a more market-friendly democratic party to a more the, the rising progressive wing. So I think that really says a lot that Friedman is perhaps subject to more debate uh, uh, in the democratic party and on the left than on the right. So, so beyond that though, beyond the feeling that, okay, maybe I'm selling Friedman short with this title, I do think there are two reasons that it fits. And one is what I've tried to convey in this talk, which is that if a conservative is one who seeks to conserve, um, that really fits Friedman the economist. You know, He went to uh, more traditional ideas like the quantity theory of money that his peers thought were you know, fallacious and sophomoric. Um, he, with Anna Schwartz, preserved this empirical tradition of building theories out of very fine-grained observations of the real world. Um, and so he conserved economic traditions and economic approaches that really otherwise would have been cast aside. And the second reason I call him uh, conservative is because of his political alliances. You know, he was consistently connected to politicians and to political movements that called themselves conservative. And American conservatism contains multitudes. Freeman is not synonymous with all of its dimensions, but he also didn't associate himself from it. So in terms of the last, this is really a, a gesture to shifts in the contemporary conservative movement, which has an influential trend towards a new suspicion of markets, a new embrace of nationalism, a new reluctance to engage in the world. Uh, like all of you, I don't really know where all of this goes, but I do know that one way to see ahead is to look back, and I hope that this portrait of Friedman provides a way to do that. I'd be happy to take your questions, whether in person or on the Zoom. Thanks so much.
I wanted to ask what he thought about Hoover <laughs> and what, what role that played for him. What, what yeah. he thought about Hoover, and, and I'm sorry to throw two in. You didn't, I think of him as a consensus builder because, you know, having written about the um, total volunteer or the all volunteer force that he championed, that committee, the, the commission that, that he, I think, led was split really harshly. And by the end, they made a unanimous recommendation to have an all volunteer force because of his abilities to, to you know, foster that. So insights on those two? Yeah, for sure. So the first question was um, Freeman's time at Hoover. And I, I touch on this a little bit, although I would say I'm really interested more in the historical Freeman, the kind of early parts of his career. I think it was a wonderful landing spot. Who was telling me it was basically a bargain between he and Rose. She said like, at a certain point, we have to move to California. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like when it's time for you to retire, we have to move to California. I'm not going to grow old in Chicago. You know, she was sick uh, of Chicago. <laughs> so it's, it's, that's a, maybe a bit flippant, but also his um, brother-in-law, Aaron Director, who was very important to both he and Rose had come out earlier. Aaron Director was one of Glenn Campbell's first hires. And I have to think, although I have no documentation for this, that Campbell was probably thinking 10 years ahead and thinking if I hire Aaron Director, I'm gonna be in a pretty good position to hire Milton Friedman down okay. the road. Um, and so I, I know he just tremendously enjoyed his time here, although he was not, uh, he lived in San Francisco and came down for events. Your second question was Friedman as consensus builder. And I think you're absolutely right. So you talk about the volunteer army, I also talk about um, what is called the, sometimes the Coe's conversion evening, which was when Ronald Coe's, a, a, a preeminent scholar of law and economics, came to Chicago. And he was invited because they decided he was he was all wrong and he'd written this wrong headed paper and he arrived 20 economists at dinner. The first person he convinced was Friedman and then Friedman just went down the row by the end of the evening had convinced all the other 20 economists that Coase was right and they kind of took off from there so. So yeah he was incredibly persuasive arguer I do think the other thing that really struck me in my research, and partly this was because my last book was on Ayn Rand, who could not compromise at all, was that Freeman was both like a purist and really knew what he believed and thought that was right, and also able to compromise and say a half loaf is better than none at all. And so he had a kind of persuasive power, a genial personality, and a temperament that was willing to be incremental, and that, that all made him very effective. Make a couple comments. I'll try to be too short. Uh, first, you mentioned the Chicago plan as as eighty percent of what actually passed. My impression was the Chicago plan was the radical alternative that no one's ever looked at, because the centerpiece was narrow banking, as opposed to uh, deposit insurance, and that I always regarded that as the original sin that led us to where we are. You were mentioning that the you know who first said uh, inflation is always and everywhere money. <laughs> I think of the, the founding influence here as being Irving Fisher, and I, I recommend a 1914 American Economic Review, which is, has the most beautiful graph of any economics uh, paper ever published on, on the quantity theory, uh, and that seems like a central place to start. Consumption, I think you're selling Friedman a little short. He did not uh, find from the household economists, oh, consumption's important, and write a paper about consumption. Why that book was important is because the consumption function was the beating heart of Keynesian economics, mm. ISLM. Mm. And the point of his, uh, his consumption theory was to drive a stake through that really, uh, heart, which I don't think his, uh, the, the, um, the household economists knew. So I, I think they may have had the answer, but he had the question, and that's really why that was so uh, important. Okay, do I get to get a word in, or we have one more? I got, I got very short ones, because I want to advertise your book. <laughs> to, to our colleagues, I, I read this whole book, and I and love it. One thing you will get out it's how very different personal and professional lives of economists were back then. Friedman went to graduate school. Nobody in his class got a job. One, Stigler got a job at the University of Iowa, and everyone thought he's the big star. Friedman had to go work in the government for 15 years. Then when he finally got a job, it was an adjunct lecturer at Wisconsin. Everybody thought this was the most wonderful job in the world. Uh, and he didn't really have to publish a lot of papers. It's all this verbal tradition. So read the book and appreciate how much are things? And the last thing I'm going to say is, I do have to object to the title, even though you apologized <laughs> a little bit. He was not the last, guy and he was not that conservative. And particularly the last, guy, <laughs> that's all wrong. He, he did not call himself a conservative. He called himself a classical liberal, and he said, "What people ask, why aren't you part of the Libertarian Party?" He said, well, you know, they're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> I, I, I think my best home is with the Republicans right now, but he's not a social conservative, and his his economics was was 
really radical in, in, in its new thing. So he wasn't he wasn't the last, he wasn't a conservative. I told you this before, I'm sorry you didn't get a chance or inspiration to change the title. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, I, I'm not gonna take all of those, but I'll just push back on the uh, consumption piece. Um, so the real early origin of that is uh, Milton, uh, sorry, Rose Friedman and Dorothy Brady's paper, um, which is on the consumption function and which is recognized as the kind of first alternative theory to the consumption function. And it uh, uh, comes out just before James Dusenberry publishes. James Tobin's aware of it. People know it's out there. And so from the beginning, it has that germ of pushing against this Keynesian centrality. And so, yes, that's there from the beginning. So they knew they Yeah, were. yeah, they knew that they knew. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, yes, they knew these were very high stakes indeed. And so I, I kind of dig into that in the book. Um, and then the Chicago plan, you're right. I mean, they would have done away with fractional reserve banking and that didn't happen, but it basically said, go off the gold standard, um, insure deposits, you know, a lot of the big structural things that were done. I, there are books on the Chicago plan. I, it, it's unclear. I think a lot of people had the same set of ideas. So it's hard to say Chicago carried the day, but it was very interesting to me that Chicago's ideas, again, were very much in the mainstream and in the policy mix at that moment. So I'd like to defend Paul Samuelson. Um, the, it's true that there was a major uh, disagreement that's reflected <laughs> in, uh, in that testimony, but um, I was trained at MIT uh, in, in 1964 to 1967, and Paul Samuelson was a member of my thesis committee. Um, and and uh, it, it dealt the, much of the paper dealt with uh, consumption, and and therefore necessarily with Friedman's dominant position. Nobody at MIT told me that I was uh, was hostile to to Friedman's work. It was deeply respected at MIT in the mid '60s. Um, you really, really, and and nobody or I got a job offer back in the days when job offers were plentiful. <laughs> Uh, from from Chicago, I did not accept it. Maybe made a mistake, but nobody at MIT said, "Oh no, we, MIT person doesn't go to Chicago." You know, they, that's that's alien territory. It was well, there are plenty of good people that, that we respect at Chicago. So this idea that that there was sort of MIT and and Yale and Harvard on one side, uh, and, and Chicago on another side. Ex to the exterior, it seemed that way, but it was not the way the interior of, of uh, certainly not the not the exposure that I had. Uh, so, so, so I disagree with uh, this. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll just say that sixty four to sixty seven is quite different than say fifty four to fifty seven, and things do change after the fifty seven book and after the sixty three book. Um, but there is really no love lost between Samuelson and Freeman. They make nice, but there's still oh, yeah. there's still friction there. But yes, the change over time aspect is very important, and that's we tend to come to Friedman and in our moment or in the moment he's on YouTube, and there is there is things things do shift over time. But thank you for sharing that. Did we have another question here? Yes. Oh, I want to go back to your remarks about Friedman's openness to the um, <clears throat> insights and contributions of women, <clears throat> which. Um, distinguished him from many of his male colleagues in the day. I agree that's a really important issue or, or observation, and it's really important to ask why. I found your explanation unconvincing. So if at least at least incomplete. So if that were if we're really the case that it's because Chicago had a tradition of having a woman on the faculty, then I would have expected to see you present some evidence that Chicago econo male economists in general were more open uh, to the contributions of women. If there is such evidence, it'd be good to put that on the table. It, it, it would, so I don't know what the explanation is. I'd like to know, but it seems to me that at least an equally plausible hypothesis is he was married to Rose, who by all accounts was an extraordinary intellect who had a profound influence on him. So how could he escape in his daily life? Uh, that uh, women could be quite insightful in his chosen professional domain. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't, beyond the kind of casual observations, I don't have more <laughs> evidence for that hypothesis, but it seems yeah. to me on the, on the surface, at least, to be more plausible than the one you advanced. 
Well, it's not the only explanation, but going back to Rose, she was also an economic student in the 1930s, which again was very rare and distinctive of Chicago and other places. There are other economists married to other female economists. I would say though, again, Margaret Reed is his professional colleague who could be hired, right? Which provides the impetus to take this from an idea we talk about in a summer home to an actual publication, right? Because he's trying to advance her career and create the world that he wants, which is not an option. If you were at Harvard, it's not gonna work to try to try to get Margaret Reed hired, right? Incidentally, she had half appointment in home economics and half in economics. So, so I do think there's an institutional explanation. There's also a personal explanation. I don't know if it has to do so much with Rose as with Friedman's, um, you know, just kind of living a life powered fully by ideas in which sometimes the ideas could rise to the fore and the other stuff could fall away. Whereas, I mean, I talk about it in some detail, the treatment of Anna Schwartz is just truly scandalous. And um, the Columbia faculty will not give her a doctorate um, basically until a monetary history is published. And Friedman has to sort of force them to give her a doctorate, but they have this sort of evidence in front of them of what she's done and they cannot recognize it. Um, and so I think there is a way in which it didn't seem so scandalous for him to recognize Schwartz. So we'll never really know, but those are some of the reasons I saw it. Yeah, Mike. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for this um, presentation. I look forward to seeing the book. I, I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about um, his involvement Bretton Woods, and I also just wanted to mention, I'm sure you're aware, but he wrote a piece called Why Europe Can't Afford the Euro in 1998 about why they shouldn't go ahead that was extremely prescient. <laughs> I, I, I'm in the foreign exchange market, so, but I, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so when Bretton Woods is kind of in its last days, Friedman is has a pipeline into the Nixon administration through Schultz. And he's very, um, you know, he's, he, if for one of the first memos he sends to Nixon is, um, you know, you need to uh, uh, move off, basically move off of gold parity. You need to just do this right away. Let's move to floating exchange rates. Um, he basically, it's the balance of payments. He calls the balance of payments a running sore that's going to erupt and you ought to lance the boil now and get it over with. And so Nixon kind of doesn't ignores him. And then we have Connolly and the move to closing the gold window. And then Freeman comes in again. And so it's his role is really memos and updates to George Schultz, who then kind of maneuvers them into Nixon's view or brings them into the treasury. And then when Schultz is in charge of the treasury, there's mu much more open line. Um, and so I think his paper on floating exchange rates, I, I mean, someone here will know, I think it's 56. It's a very, very long uh, uh, time ago. And what I basically say in the book, or it's, it's much before Bretton Woods unfolds, it's not that he's the only person who sees this system can't last. Many people see it can't last. He's one of the few to say, it's great that it can't last. We're going to break on through to the other side and it's going to be a better world. And here's what that world should look like. A lot of the other um, responses are sort of, how can we patch this together? How can we jerry-rig it? How can we build something that will do pretty much the same thing, but be different? And so I think Friedman has that kind of radical vision um, that's very much in line also with his thinking in general. I didn't emphasize it too much here, but what I try to really convey to uh, maybe a non-economics audience is his focus on prices as both allocators and as sort of structuring policy is really innovative. So exchange rates should be, currency should be priced in a free market, basically. It's the global extension of his basic desideratum for prices um, to structure markets without too much intervention. So, so yeah, I kind of follow that off and on. Um, and I, I am aware of some of his comments on the Euro, but I don't think that's a, a really a major theme in the book, but thank you for your question. Can, can I quickly follow up on that one, John? I was kind of interrupted last time, so let me <laughs> just make a few comments and observations, some of which, some of which complement yours and Bob's, but um, I have a lot of personal remembrances of Milton. I'm sure many of you do. I've had many interactions with him. 
starting with him writing a seven page handwritten note to me, congratulating me on my undergraduate honors thesis, <laughs> which I foolishly never kept, oh. uh, but I uh, sent it from Vermont, um, which was very generous, was on the negative income tax. And that was obviously an idea of his and Jim Tobin's separately. Um, I do want to say that uh, you, you, there were some things you didn't mention. I'll ask you to, if you want to comment on, you didn't mention Ronald Reagan and the influence that Friedman had on at least some people in the Reagan administration in general free market ideas. Um, he didn't mention his column with Paul Samuelson, the dueling columns in Newsweek, which was very important as a public intellectual in spreading these debates and ideas. Um, you maybe you have mentioned them in your book, but you didn't, maybe you didn't have time. I just want to mention a few. Um, Arthur Burns, um, was not my favorite Fed chairman, but he did at least rail against deficit spending in the middle of a raging inflation, which has not always been his predecessor's successor's uh, modus operandi. Uh, I want to second what John said about Irving Fisher, who, picking up on something Bob said, was really a revered figure at Yale. So if you're talking about this access of Keynesian stuff, Irving was, and actually his work in this area was what led him to generate superlative index numbers. And he actually said that in 1920, that if his entire life work, um, if people would start using geometric averages rather than arithmetic averages, it would make his entire life's work worthwhile. But it grew out of the work that John is mentioning. Um, then there are a few other observations about his methodological work. Um, you didn't have time to mention his essays on essay on positive economics, which was extremely influential, at least to my generation. Uh, pardon? Excessive. Well, maybe, maybe. And he, <laughs> but one of the things that he always seemed to me was somebody who did empirical work informed by theory. Now you can argue what the balance is, where the ch which the chicken came with with the egg. You know, you derive predictions; they didn't work. You change your theory. You know, Einstein did. You know, saw the mistake in the place of mercury by a quarter of a degree or something. Um, but it seems to me that that uh, is something that has always been kind of a, a to and fro in the economics profession. And while perhaps Coles was kind of weighted to one side, stayed that way, with, um, a lot of Nobel Prizes came out of that, by the way. Um, but that's something that I think is uh, has kind of gotten a renewed emphasis in economics in the last 20 years or so. Also, picking up on what Bob had to say at MIT, before the theory of the consumption function, which is basically looking at long run averages, permanent income, and all this sort of stuff, Franco Modigliani had a paper with Brumberg on basically life cycle, which was kind of related conceptually. Uh, so it's not like these ideas were totally independent, not intertwined, not bouncing off of each other. Um, and then I had one other thing. Um, yeah, I also might personally, I found Milton um, an extremely generous person and also an extremely personally egalitarian person. Yes, yes. He would just as soon argue about the minimum wage with a janitor as with a CEO or mm -hmm. with his fellow economists. Mm -hmm. And at any and, conference, he would always put his tag on, he insisted on, on being anonymous as if he was just a stranger. It was, it, yeah. was, it was very, very yeah. remarkable. Maybe yeah, why yeah. you appreciated so, women, just egalitarianism. <clears throat> they're, they're, but they're people. It very much struck me. Actually, just real quickly, my final observation is one of my first administrative assignments yes. when I came to Stanford as a young assistant professor was to uh, organize what was called the All Department Seminar, which mm -hmm. existed for a while, fell into abeyance, unfortunately, has been kind of reestablished mm -hmm. in recent yes, years. We're having it soon. Yeah, yeah. And, and Bob actually been uh, uh, heavily involved in picking the speakers, et cetera. And so I invited Friedman and Samuelson out. And to somebody who was very impressionable, 24, 25 year old, their personal uh, interactions were quite different than the public notion of liberals are sort of in favor of the little guy and conservatives are these harsh, tough love people, et cetera. Um, they're both obviously immensely impressive people, but just FYI, uh, I don't know if that, if you saw that strain in the book, uh, if you have that in there, but it just seems to me to something that was, you know, maybe if I think of my homepage for Milton, when I think about him, it's one of the first things I think about. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. I'll just say I think John is right and goes back to your question that this uh, ability to just kind of take people in front of him for who they were without the status trappings, I think is probably a large part of why he was able to work with Schwartz um, and, and the others. And I will say that uh, Modigliani actually does talk about Margaret Reed's paper and is aware of that work. Um, to Fisher, um, Fisher actually works with Simons, Henry Simons and Fisher kind of working hand in glove on some of these reforms. And Friedman will mention him and say the great Irving Fisher. I think he actually, when queried who is the greatest economist, I think he says Irving Fisher. Um, but he's not sort of presence in his biography in a great deal. Um, but yes, I do talk about Reagan and Newsweek and all of those, um, the, the kind of greatest hits are definitely in there. So for sure. I look forward to reading it. Good. Yeah. Um, first, a comment, you're, you make it sound like he was competing against economists doing, as you say, large scale general equilibrium models and at the same time, but <clears throat> 50s, there was none of that going on. The first large-scale general glue model of, that I don't think anybody knows of was by Leif Johansson in his 1960 book and PhD thesis, which of course no American certainly was aware of at the time. It was in Norway. Um, so that that wasn't the nature of most economics in at that time. Now, the on the opposite, the 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 I don't know how much you talk. I took a look at your index. I don't know how much you talked about this, but he he did. We was the the lead man in terms of arguing for tax withholding, income tax withholding. Now I always wondered, okay, was he just like a lawyer? He his boss told him to advocate for this, go to Congress, testify for this. What I mean, income tax withholding? Nineteen forty two. He's working for Treasury. Yeah, because um, because basically. We, we realized that uh, after accepting the German and Japanese invasion to have uh, Japanese invitations to World War II, we didn't have a tax system that would finance it. And so we had to raise taxes. And then there's this worry about, well, you think people are going to save money to pay taxes next year for taxes on, on income this year? So then we had to have income taxes holding. I always wondered now, when he advocated that, and you talk about how he did some some research behind it. Was he just doing a good job as an advocate, or did he believe it that uh, that if you don't, if you actually don't tack, take it out of their pockets today, they aren't going to save up for it um, and have the cash on hand next year? Now, so I did a little reading about this, and in, and afterwards, so he he believed the argument. Now, I don't know if you talk about this at all, but but he he um, in the 50s, he says tax withholding was awful because it meant that you could raise a lot more revenues. So I, I regard him as one of the first uh, behavioral economists, um, because the whole business about how people don't properly uh, plan for the future, et cetera, which is a theme in behavioral economics. This is an argument he made to Congress and that he believed. And uh, contradicts permanent income, <laughs> which contradicts permanent income hypothesis. Yeah. So, so, I, so the thing is, what I regard about Milton is that he was a pragmatic kind of guy. He was a common sense kind of guy. He knew he had some feeling about how far you could push theory, and and he he would uh, he he moderated his view. So he believed yeah. that tax withholding did was necessary and did have an impact on total revenue. The other thing that we talk about him being conservative, he was an advocate for getting rid of drug, the drug, getting rid of the drug war. Now that certainly isn't anything that anybody calls himself conservative would be for. Except for William F. Buckley. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, can I answer some he of the to points? Drugs. Um, so, and part of well, the- yeah, yeah, but that's um, not what we call conservative today. Uh, part, of the, part of your question just jogged my memory on uh, uh, Michael's point and on the methodology um, on the theory versus empirics, that was at the nub of his dispute with the institutional economists and Wesley Mitchell's assessment. So you're right, it's a long running theme and I, I do cover that in some detail. Okay, so the question about taxation is great and it's kind of both. So on the one hand, he was just a technician doing his job and figuring out the most efficient way to do this. And he, he um, you know, 
played an important role in figuring out how it could be done, although it wasn't implemented until he left. On the other hand, he was a supporter of taxation uh, uh, in the wartime context to prevent inflation, which it leads to this whole like, oh, he must have been a Keynesian. Well, what I argue is that the alternative to taxing um, was rationing and price controls. And he said, Rebel. right, but a more developed apparatus in the service of stopping wartime inflation. He said, actually, what would be better is to pull this money out of the economy by taxing because that will that will be sort of monetary policy via fiscal means. So yes, and also the other thing is World War II for him is completely different emergency time. It's like the first years of the Great Depression. So I don't think his thinking or decision making in the fight against the Nazis is a good proxy for like, here's how we should run the economy in ordinary time. And he also did not see coming that taxes once implemented on a mass scale could just continually ratchet up. And so at the end of his career, he's very interested in tax limitation. So, so yes, although I, uh, I've been telling you how, you know, the major themes in Friedman's thought are set early, they definitely evolve in response to circumstance. He wrote um, a very influential paper while at the Treasury in 43 on taxing expenditure rather than income. Yeah, and I would just one more thing about uh, the competition with Coles and, and Coles was um, in the trend of, of, of a different type of approach to economics. And he like literally stole their Rockefeller grant. So it was about as pure competition as competition could be. <laughs> so. uh, Mickey has a question. Mickey? Yes, uh, Jennifer, at least the way you described it today, um, Friedman, you know, all of a sudden lashed out at Arthur Burns about income policies. But but in fact, Burns in the late 1950s started indicating his preference for income policies, and then he certainly, when he was counselor to Nixon in in um, 69 and 70, and then when he became chair, he just made it absolutely clear. So I think Friedman was well aware. Of it. I think their relationship was. Um, simmering and heading south and then he lashed out at him more so from a political purpose that, that he was just so upset at burns but the, but the, the 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 difference in their economic philosophies there was a wedge between them for over a decade yeah it's interesting i i definitely see that i don't know that friedman saw that um there's like an interesting moment where he tells all his, I think Stigler's in visiting in Columbia or maybe he worked at Columbia and he's, oh, you gotta go see Arthur Burns talk. And so Stigler takes a bunch of people and they go and they write back and they're kind of like, it wasn't really that great of a talk. They're trying to be polite. Um, and then um, Burns won't review a monetary history. He won't read the manuscript. He won't comment on it. And he says, oh, it's conflict of interest. And so I think I think Friedman doesn't see what everyone else sees because he worships Burns so much and he thinks that um, they must agree because he admires Burns so much. So so when I as I read the relationship and the correspondence, this is a significant break that maybe a lot of other people see coming, but um and and Burns, I don't think, has the same depth of feeling for Friedman as Friedman has for Burns. And so it's um it's a really interesting dynamic. Go ahead. Can I, if I can have seconds. <laughs> it's such a good lunch. Um, I think you're right, exactly right on compromising views, which I think is a, a an advantage. Even monetarism itself, you know, the, the anti-Keynesian view was sort of, oh, it's a general equilibrium system, don't worry, it'll work itself out, which, which had its um, you know, real business cycles took that on again. But Friedman couldn't have done real business cycles. Technically he couldn't, and it wouldn't have caught on. So what he came up with was really 90% of Keynesianism will just, the, we use monetary policy instead of fiscal policy, but still the framework is basically all aggregate demand and just a slightly different set of letters, levers. Well, that was going to work at the time, and which is, that's not really criticism. That's just a fact of how you be influential. The, the Cowles Commission fight, it's interesting. I don't think anyone at this table can say what the Cowles Commission was or what it did, which is maybe why the fight didn't resonate so much. But let me ask wow. you two questions. How about, how did Friedman react? These are honest questions for once. How did Friedman react to the things where he turned out to be wrong? And, and what I have in mind there, um, 
exchange rates. He, he thought floating exchange rates, did he have any idea how much exchange rates would vary once they become floating? I, I, you know, it seems like a great idea once they're pegged and oh, they'll maybe up and down. But the idea that exchange rates would change 10% a year, did, did he have any comment on, wow, that's more than I thought? And the most obvious one is he argued for the money supply, the Fed tried it and it didn't work and went right back to interest rate targeting and uh, you know, kind of the, the fall of the central tenet of monetarism. Friedman was still around in the 1990s and yet every central bank was pegging interest rates and the idea of controlling the money supply just seemed to vanish. How, how did he react to that? Um, so I don't, I don't actually know or cover in the book his kind of mea culpa on, on exchange rates. He continued to think, as did George Schultz, that IMF and the World Bank should be like folded up and go away. Well, that you know, these, you these weren't anticipated that it would be so volatile. Yeah. I, can't imagine. I don't I don't recall a lot of commentary on that, although it may be out there. Someone may correct me on that. Um, the money supply for sure, he wrestled with that. And a couple things he said, you know, I wouldn't push aggregates so much. I wouldn't push the money supply so much. Um in the beginning, when uh, Volcker kind of tried to say, uh, you know, it didn't work because of financial reform, Friedman said that that's balderdash. And then later, he does <clears throat> say in, in Money Mischief, you know, I've come to appreciate the institutional structure really matters a lot for how um, aggregates play out. Um, but then he does eventually figure out you can reanalyze M2 and this relationship between M2 and inflation, he says it sort of goes away like the early 80s and then it comes back. So in some ways he decides that this central insight on M2 has been vindicated, although he definitely is humble in public. And I, I think he comes to see that, I mean, this is what I really talk about in the book. It's this tremendous irony, you know, monetarism is built for this, uh, a certain type of world, a regulated world, inflation comes along, there's all types of deregulation, and suddenly it doesn't work anymore because you have money moving from checking to savings and interest rates go up and down. And so there are these big shifts in economic regimes and Freeman doesn't appreciate that at the time. You know, Even though he's done all this deep historical work, he still has this kind of timeless principles orientation of, of sort of theory that always works. But I, I honestly, I had a narrative in my head when I began this book based on some other accounts I had read that he became like old and crotchety and fixed, you know, and I think, oh, no, not oh, no, I no. think that's really not true. Um, I think there was a moment of fame when he maybe was not as subtle in his discussions as he could have been, but I was really struck at the end of his life. He really said, um, I was wrong about the process of globalization. You know, he said, when the wall came down, I said, privatize, privatize, privatize. And he said, now I realize that's not enough. The rule of law is more fundamental. And so, so these interviews from the last year of his life, he's like, well, I was wrong about this, wrong about that. So I really appreciated that. I was like, this is really great. Like he could be doing a victory lap and he's pretty reflective. And he's also in the last years of his life, he's very concerned about globalization. As he sees it happen, he's like, wait a second, what's gonna happen to low-skilled workers? You know, And he's basically like, low-skilled workers in America are really going to suffer. This is why it leads back to education and vouchers, and we have to improve the US education system. So, um, which I see is that sort of continuing worry from the 1930s of like, how do we make sure this like incredible engine of economic growth doesn't really leave people out in a way that's really dangerous to the fabric of society. Abe has a question. Abe. I wanted to add a, 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 an instance where I personally experienced this kind of interesting humility that he had uh, when he talked about ideas. He just cared about the ideas so much that status just didn't matter. It was at a Hoover event, and it was just before 2001, the collapse of the markets. And he speaking to a, a group of uh, Hoover supporters, and, and um, he said, I don't understand it. Uh, the market was still flying high. It was, and he said, I, I can't understand the market. I don't understand how they could reach these prices. It makes absolutely no sense. It should have collapsed. But I don't know how you can take me seriously. I've been saying that for the last few years, every year. And of course, the next year, boom, you know, everything happened just the way he said. But it just showed how he was ready to re-examine his own thoughts. Uh, and 
but he stuck by his idea. And um, anyone who bet on bet on him that year did really well. <laughs> Thank you. You used to. I want to, I want to, re times. I want to reinforce your comments about women, especially Rose, because in all the times I was with him, including like debating Ken Arrow, et cetera, the only persons, the only two people he ever stopped cold and let them go ahead were Rose and George Schultz. Hmm. Period. <laughs> including several people in the room who have witnessed, have weren't given that grace. Yeah, smart man, yeah. smart man. Do we have other any other Zoom? Go ahead, Bob. So on, on, on monetary policy, uh, uh, Friedman clearly was left behind uh, and, and his place has been taken by John Taylor and the Taylor rule. Um, and I, I had a private chat with him about this as it was happening. And, and I asked him, aren't you, aren't you gonna fight this or whatever? <laughs> he said, no, but I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna take a stand on it. I'll just, and, and he basically did that. He didn't make any, as far as I know, made no public utterance defending uh, any concern of the quantity of money uh, after sometime in like 1995. Yeah. Is that right? So, I mean, maybe John's gonna disagree with me on this, but I do think, you know, from the historian's high level perspective, there's a kind of tradition of rules over discretion that Friedman really saw himself as part of. Kind of Simons was kind of the first evocator of this. I think F.A. Hayek is an example of it. And I sort of feel like John is in that tradition. So I think they are updated for the time, but the basic idea that economies prosper when you have clear, transparent expectations and rules and there shouldn't be too much um, just policymakers discretion can lead to, to really bad outcomes. I think that's like a through line. And I think that continues. I think that's like one of the sort of fundamental lessons. I even feel like inflation targeting all these, these are all this sort of move to frameworks I, I see as in the general gist of Friedman's thought, um, even if the specific details really um, are different. And I don't think Friedman always saw that himself. So it's sort of like a bit of a tragedy because I'm like, you lost the battle, but you won the war, you know? <laughs> like, So that's that's how I see it at least. So speaking of, of the war, you you refer to many books in your, do you have a favorite? Do you, do you have, oh, do one? I have a favorite book? Like yes. in general, oh, of, of Friedman's. Of Friedman's, is it capitalism? You have capitalism and freedom in your um, I mean, it's really a monetary history, like no doubt. Like I read that book, I was just blown away. I was like, wow, the history of the United States where money is the protagonist, like, you know, marching along and like, here's the civil war and here's like the gold stuff. And it's like, whoa, it just, because you read, you get familiar with this history as a historian and there's all these different actors. And then to see the kind of economic forces and, and monetary institutions and mo that really just really blew me away. And then I think that analysis of the great depression is also so, it's really like history at its finest. It's the longest book too. What's that? It's a long book. It's a long book. Oh yeah, I, believe me, I read that cover to cover, you know? Uh, that was one of the first things I did when starting, right? Because I was like, who is this guy who thinks he's a historian but is actually an economist, you know? And I read it, I was like, okay, I get a little bit of a gist here. <laughs> did you say anything about the second volume? You didn't even mention the second volume. Of the 1982 volume? I really just kind of let it go. I talk about it a little bit. There's a kind of, there's a small literature on it. I feel like it was not the finest work and I'm really trying to focus on the big contributions. Um, so I talk about it, but I don't dig into it. And I know, I mean, there's a whole like mini literature in England. There's a bunch of British economists who are like, this book is so bad. And I'm sort of like, this is not the main contribution. So I touch on it, but lightly. I wrote, I wrote the JEL review, book review. I might quote it. I'm not sure if I do. Were you kind of gentle about it? Kind of gentle. Yes. I, I went off on certain <laughs> <laughs> extravagances that, that uh, yeah. could have been in the book, but weren't. Sequels are rarely as good as the original. <laughs> what, what didn't you like about it, Bob, quickly? Um, Having not read it, were your review? <laughs> no. <laughs> I should have prepared uh, for that question. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a while ago. All, all the crazy ideas that I've promoted since then are are are, are mentioned there. Uh, That's a long review. The ones, the ones that you know well. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the wooden, the wooden dollar, and some others. One thing I really like about your book is you go into certain areas and you do the areas that 
do you think are most relevant? And I, one of the things I, I were a few questions of maybe Mike and Abe asked about this, this stuff at Hoover is somehow interspersed. I don't know if it's, I mean, I have so many memories of this stuff on the third floor going to his house in San Francisco and being our house, just so many good memories. Yeah, yeah. On Pebble Beach. And I wish they were there. I know, you know, I, I use your interview with him, I think it's like a very valuable document for his kind of thinking later um, in his career. I mean, I will admit to a bit of fatigue. Um, <laughs> by the time I get to the point in his life when he's at Hoover, you know, I've been going since 1912, you know, <laughs> um, and so, so I cover it, I touch upon it. I think what's really important is, you know, Hoover's part of how he gets connected to the Reagan administration. Um, you know, he meets Martin Anderson and they become friendly. And then that's like a, a renaissance. Again, he's brought back into a very important advisory role for the Reagan administration. Um, I think I'm trying to remember the exact date of him. I don't think he's at Hoover yet when he meets Margaret Thatcher. I could be wrong about that. Um, but you know, he certainly um, has a connection to her as well. So I think what his time here does is keeps him from kind of going out to pasture, right? And it, it changes his um, perspective from just narrowly economic to these broader ideas. And there's a moment when he really steps back from economic dispute and debate, even as his ideas are being taken up and sort of taken more seriously, the field is getting more quantitative and more mathematical. And I, I cover, his reaction to, you know, Lucas and the Lucas critique, and he's just quiet about it. I think it's not, it's the conclusion is one he would reach, but the method is not one he would have approved of, but he just is kind of quiet about it. Yeah. Um, so I think everything, if, if we think about a fourth Chicago school, that's real business cycle and um, the Lucas critique, he's, he's not really on board with that, but he just decides to not take it on. And instead, he's going to focus on, I'll just talk to Ronald Reagan, you know, so I understand why. <laughs> There's a, uh, a, a big part of his influence on Reagan came from a dinner George Schultz had in 1979 that I was at, and a couple other economists, and Milton. I was given the assignment of pushing Reagan hard on supply-side economics, what was real <laughs> and exaggerated about it, and Milton on inflation. And by the end of that, Reagan had made it very clear he would support this inflation. He did that in the early 80s at great political cost. And I think a lot of people say that the, six, the original big chunk of this inflation was because Reagan gave him some cover, even though he knew it was going to cost him a lot. Yeah, that does seem to be that that Friedman provided a really solid explanation of why he should do that, why he should let Volcker do what he needed to do. And so, yeah, that was significant. There were others. Tom Sargent at the time was very influential academically about credibility could reduce the cost and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I should say, um, I haven't touched on it here, but there's really a theme of following the history of the Federal Reserve through the book and from, you know, there's Friedman's critique of the Fed and then there's the Fed in the 1950s, which is sort of not all that important. And then there's Friedman's role as like chief Fed critic, you know, and he used to show up and in the beginning, he would do a Ron Paul, like, let's abolish the Fed, you know, and over time, he was like, well, no, no one's taking me seriously when I say that. So let's have a K percent growth rule. Now I get somewhere, you know, but he and the other thing is, is a Fed response to Friedman and the modern Fed that is transparent and open. Of course, there's an expectations revolution. But even before that, there is Friedman knocking on his door and Schwartz knocking his door and saying, I really do believe they start keeping track of M1 and M2 and publicizing it because if they don't do it, Friedman and Schwartz are going to do it and they want some control of the information. So he really moves the Fed and you can see there'll be like these puff pieces like the Fed is so great. And you can tell this is like three months after monetary history is published, right? And they're trying to kind of, they really, he's a, you know, he's a, a pebble in their shoe for a long time. And so I trace that institutional history. And what's so interesting to me is that, you know, I've grown up in a world where it's like the Fed chairman is the most important person. And when you study the history, it's like the Fed is a, is not really where anybody thinks the action is. And they're highly secretive. They don't say anything. 
they were do they released their notes like a, five years there's meeting minutes come out five years after the meeting so it's just a completely different world than we're in today and i think that that for me was very interesting to see how that changed over time and powerless people thought people didn't think the fed had any power to do much of anything yeah well so arthur burns i'm inflation done here inflation is wage price spirals and unions and so forth now we may have gone in the opposite direction of thinking the Fed runs everything. Uh, Milton yeah. may have won a little bit too much, but uh, it's really remarkable how different the world was. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. The, uh, there's, Thank you. there's copies of the book, so pick up a couple or three. And I believe for those in person, I will be signing copies okay, so right. I can oh, uh, meet you over there you so in the corner. Thank you.